Good morning. We're going to get started. And um, I just want to welcome everyone back after our Easter break, although not in college, it sounds like it. Um, I hope you all had a, a wonderful Easter and time of knowing the blessings and hope that Easter brings each of us. So I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Tracy Eide. We are winding down the book of 2 Samuel, and Tracy will be bringing chapter 23 to us. So would you join me in prayer? You want to come up, Tracy? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time of gathering again for a Bible study. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for what we can uh, learn from it each week. And thank you for this week, Lord, as uh, we will learn from Tracy's teaching. Father, I thank you for how she has um, willingly given her time to study, to be in your word, to hear from you what you would have for her. And I pray, Father, that we would learn as um, you have taught her. Thank you for the uh, words that are everlasting, Lord, in, in Scripture. Thank you for the reminders each week of your hope, the hope in your promises, and that your kingdom is forever. Lord, I pray that you would uh, make your spirit so real to Tracy right now. Give her the peace, give her the confidence, and let her words reach each of us, Lord, where we need to hear it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy and your blessings each and every day. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. So I have put my outline up here. Um, it's kind of a all over the place chapter, so I thought it might help to be able to follow where I'm at. Um, so hopefully that will help. So, yes, as Maureen said, we are nearing the end of our study of First and Second Samuel and the life of David. And we come to a chapter with the last words of David and listings of David's mighty men. And as I found out with so many of the chapters, a precursory reading left me feeling slightly underwhelmed and confused about the significance of the passage and slightly overwhelmed with all of the characters and their difficult names. And there's a lot of them in this chapter. But as I dove in, slowed down, prayed, and read the commentaries, I began to see some beautiful things and gain an increased understanding and appreciation of this chapter. The Holy Spirit plus study plus time will often do that when we read the word. And uh, for me, that is one of the great values of this Bible study, just being reminded of the value of diving deep in God's word. So let's dive in. And we'll start with this, that David's last words are not actually David's last words. <laughs> he doesn't actually die until the next book, 1 Kings chapter 2. And there are other documented words of David, including when he makes Solomon king and gives him instructions. But these words in this chapter are important words, kind of like a last will and testament or last official words. It's also called an oracle of David. An oracle is defined as words of an infallible authority and guide, or in the biblical context, a divine communication or prophecy. We're going to pause on this idea of prophecy because it's pretty important. We don't normally think of David as a prophet. Remember, though, that when he was anointed as king by Samuel in chapter 16, it says, and from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. We also have this affirmed in the New Testament when the Apostle Peter refers to David as a prophet in Acts 2. Peter is preaching to the crowd right after receiving the Holy Spirit and refers to David's words in Psalm 1610, where it says, You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Peter says about this, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, 
He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So basically, Peter's saying that David had to be talking about Jesus and not about himself, because we know that David did die. The Apostle Paul also refers to this Psalm 16 as a prophecy about Jesus. So even though David could not have imagined how God would raise Jesus' body from the dead and keep it from decaying, God spoke through him as a prophet. This passage in 2 Samuel is another example of David writing as a prophet. David himself makes it clear by insisting on us knowing that his words are not from him, but from God. Four times he emphasizes this point in verses 2 and 3. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. So before we move on to the actual prophecy, we need to back up for a minute and look at verse 1 because it's an important list. It's the things that David wants us to know about himself. First, he refers to himself as the son of Jesse. Jesse is not one of the most remembered characters in the Bible. In fact, he's just listed as the father of David and the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. The significance of this mention is to remind readers of where David started out, his humble beginnings. He was the son of a farmer and a kid who watched over the sheep when he was chosen to be anointed as the king of Israel. This is an important aspect of who David was that gives any glory that there is to be given to God. Being a son of Jesse also marks David as a true Israelite and of the tribe of Judah, which are qualifications from the Torah to be king. David goes on to describe, describe himself as a man who was raised on high and anointed of the God of Jacob. It's passive on his part. He was raised and was chosen. His ascension to kingship and his amazing military victories and leadership are all attributed to God. As the commentator Bergen says, David's selection by the God who is above all meant that he could be lifted above any human limitations. Being anointed of the God of Jacob also connected him to the fathers of Israel, the ones to whom the promises were made. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were also human men who made a lot of mistakes and God chose and used anyway, just like David. Any of the victories and things that went well for David as part of being raised on high only came when he was seeking the Lord and depending on him. This is something that we have seen again and again in this study. The difference between when David sought the Lord's face and counsel and when he didn't. We shouldn't miss this lesson. As we've said before, whenever there are repeated themes in the Bible, it means we really need to pay attention. We need to ask ourselves, are we seeking him in every aspect of our lives or just the big things? Are we just praying for reactively to problems or are we praying proactively for the Lord to go before us in everything we do? Do we ask him open-ended questions like, Lord, who needs my help this week? And what do you want my summer to look like, God? And what do I need to talk to my child about? And how can I love my family or coworkers better? Are we asking him how he wants us to use our gifts how he wants us to serve in the church, how he wants us to spend our time, or are those our decisions? Do we feel like certain things are ours to deal with and certain things are his to deal with? We probably need to even pray that he would show us what we are not seeking him about. I find that this helps me to hold things loosely. The more controlling I am with my life, the more stressed I am. Okay, so back to verse 1. The last of the four things that David wants us to know about himself is that he is the sweet psalmist of Israel. Or as an NIV translation says, the hero of Israel's songs. He was the subject of many songs after his victories in battle and the writer of many songs. Remember how Saul was so annoyed because the women were singing songs about David and not about him? The psalms that he wrote were sung by the Israelites for generations and have carried many saints through hard times. 
God has used David's suffering to bring comfort and help to all of us. He's taught me not only that it's okay to rant against God in painful times, but he's given us the words for it. When I feel like I have no words, he gives me the words through the Psalms. When I'm really struggling to pray and can't, I often turn to the Psalms. They have taught me how to move from the depths of despair to a weak and needy prayer of faith, and then to worship of a God that is always good and always mighty and always loving. This could be one of David's most important roles in life as the one who has taught believers through the Psalms over thousands of years how to cry out to the Lord in suffering and still believe and still worship. He uses this gift of beautiful writing and poetry in the prophecy he's about to give as well. So now that we are thoroughly convinced that the following prophecy is from God and not from a mere man, and that this mere man has only been raised up by his great God, let us approach these verses with great certainty and awe. Starting in the second half of verse 3, it says, When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. My initial understanding of this was that if you have a good leader that is righteous and just, the people will be blessed. Sounds logical enough, but this is not just a proverb. It's a prophecy about the Messiah, the coming King. Yes, these are helpful words and admonitions to David's descendants, but it's so much more than that. How do we know this though? Well, for one, David's emphasis on the fact that these are words from God, not from him. Dale Ralph Davis writes, the emphatic stress on divine inspiration in verses 1 to 3a is hardly compatible with a rather bland statement about what a king ought to be like. David speaks then of the last David. So this is the king in the line of Davidic kings that will be able to actually fulfill being completely righteous and having a perfect fear of God. Another reason we know it's a prophecy is from the Hebrew. In the original language, this was much more succinct. Dale Ralph Davis translates it like this, ruler over mankind dash righteous, ruler dash fear of God. So you can see when it's put like that, that David's not speaking in generalities, but about a specific king. The extra words are added in English for syntax. Also, the word men, ruler over men, in the original is more like ruler over humanity. There is no earthly king that rules over all of humanity. David ruled over Israel and Judah. Even Queen Elizabeth was only sovereign over a total of 32 countries. Only King Jesus, God himself, is ruler over all of humanity. So now that we have determined that this is about the Christ, let's look at what it says. Jesus will rule righteously, perfectly over all people, and when he does, it will be like the morning light coming after a cold, dark night. It will be a beautiful relief after all of our less than perfect earthly rulers. Everything will be done with the fear of God and there will be nothing unjust or evil. It goes on to say that it will be like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning. I love the early mornings, especially now in the spring. So peaceful, refreshing, and hopeful. God gives us spring every year to remind us that all things will be made new. Sometimes I'm hurrying off to work in the morning, and I walk outside, and I'm just stopped in my tracks by the sunrise, or the way the light sparkles off the dew and the grass, it can be stunning. That's just a small foretaste of the peace, refreshment, and hope that will be unending in his kingdom. It says Jesus' rule will be like the rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. Sunshine and rain make things grow. They bring life. Jesus repeatedly referred to himself as the light and the living water. So moving on to verse 5. David says, For does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? 
is David saying that his house is like this, that his house is righteous? Because we know it's not. No, he is seeing this light, this prophecy in light of the everlasting covenant that was made to him in chapter 7. The covenant where God promised that David's house and kingdom will endure forever and that his throne will be established forever. Tim Chester in his commentary explains it like this. He says, David's house is right with God, not because it always acts in a right way. It does not. It's right with God because of God's covenant. And this covenant creates the expectation of a coming son of David, a righteous one who will rule rightly. The next few verses are the contrast of an evil ruler, one that does the opposite of bringing growth, life, refreshment, and hope. They are compared to thorns that choke out the plants and bring harm and death. The farmer has to burn them. There are many examples of these kinds of leaders, but unfortunately, modern history has provided us the perfect example in Vladimir Putin. Most of you know that we lived for many years in Ukraine, so you can imagine how gut-wrenching this past year has been. <laughs> to watch our other home, our friends, and our neighbors be attacked so ruthlessly without reason. Putin decided that he wanted Ukraine as his own, and he would, as it says in John 10.10, 10, steal, kill, and destroy to get it. War in and of itself is bad enough, but this is so much worse. Putin's army has targeted apartment buildings, schools, and hospitals, so that over 8,000 civilians have been killed and over 14,000 civilians have been injured. Russia's soldiers have raped, tortured, and starved Ukrainian people in their own homes. Can you even imagine? And just a few weeks ago, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin for forcibly deporting Ukrainian children to Russia. Somewhere between 16,000 and 307,000 children have been stolen. All this, and then he lies to the world and his own people by denying everything. He is the essence of an evil ruler. I could go on, but I won't. I share this because it's crucial to be in prayer often for these people. Until our righteous ruler comes back, we are called to pray against evil. If you don't know how to pray, remember to look in the Psalms. If you don't know where to find news, go to voiceofukraine.com. It has daily stories from Ukrainian Christians, our friends there, and from the churches there about what's happening. The contrast is stark. Someday our King Jesus will come back like the light pushing back the darkness and finish off evil for good. He will bring healing instead of harm, justice instead of atrocities, truth instead of lies, and life instead of death. It will be everything we've ever longed for. So moving on in 2 Samuel 23, the second half of this chapter is about David's mighty men. We started hearing about these guys in chapter 21. Remember Sibachai the Hushethite? No? That's okay. <laughs> Luckily, the stories about these amazing victories of these guys aren't included in scripture, so we remember them or remember their names. In fact, even the great King David, as we've learned, is not to be revered and remembered for all he did. The main point of his greatness and his not-so-greatness for that matter, is to point to the greater king to come, the great David's greater son, a perfect and righteous king. These men did amazing things in battle, though, with fierce loyalty to their king, and it's pretty neat that God chose to include their names in scripture. It, it says a lot about what our God is like and how he pays attention to the details in our lives and loves us. I, however, will not be recounting the details of their stories or attempting to pronounce all of their names. <laughs> there is a lot written in the commentaries about the discrepancies in the numbers of these men. A similar list is given in 1 Chronicles 11 with 16 more men, and the commentators compare and contrast these lists. I'm not going into these details either, but for those of you who are interested, the summary is this. There may be different groups that are known as the three, so take that into account. 
at different times. And then there are actually 37 men listed here in case anybody counted. So that the 30 may be more like the name of an elite club than an exact number of some men, um, than an exact number as some of the men would die and others would be added. So it was kind of a changing number. But one significant thing about this list is that despite all of the might and glory in it, it ends with the name of Uriah. Uriah, who David had killed to cover up his adultery with Bathsheba. Mary Evans writes, it is almost certainly a deliberate but low-key way of drawing attention to the fact that even kings like David had their failures. And it could also have been a way of inferring that these mighty warriors may be heroes but they are not to be given the trust of the people that should be accorded only to God himself. A few more things about these men. We learned in 1 Samuel 22 that these men joined David when he was running from Saul, and they were described as people who were, quote, in distress, in debt, and discontented. A motley crew. The fact that these men became great warriors speaks highly of David's military leadership their loyalty to, to him, and of course, God's mighty way of working out his plans. It also speaks of God choosing the weak things of the world to shame the strong, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 1.27. Fighting for David was the equivalent of fighting for the kingdom of God, because God chose David as the next king of Israel and promised the Messiah would come from his descendants. God worked mightily in and through these men, as it says in verse 10, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And again in verse 12, and the Lord worked a great victory. It's such a wonderful reassurance that it's God who works in the battles against evil and the battles in our lives. I'd like to end by zooming in on the story in verses 13 to 17 of three of the mighty men. David was running from his enemies again, hiding in the cave at Adullam, and decidedly not on the throne as king. To top it off, the Philistines seemed to be taunting him by camping out at his hometown of Bethlehem. In Psalm 42 and Psalm 57, and possibly even others, they, they were written in this cave. So we know that he felt discouraged and defeated. We see it in his words in these psalms. He's crying out to the Lord for mercy. How could God's promise of his descendants being on the throne forever possibly be true if he couldn't even get on the throne? As for the water, he didn't actually need it. He wasn't longing for water because he was thirsty. There were springs of water in the cave. In fact, the cave was made of limestone walls carved out by water. So when his friends came, he sighed and expressed a longing for home, a longing for the normalcy of drinking water from the well at Bethlehem, like he must have as a child. He longed to see God's promises come to fruition and longed to begin the job that God had called him to as king. And maybe he was tired of waiting. Three of his top commanders see this despondency in him and sense the urgency of the problem. If David is discouraged, then his leaders and followers will lose courage as well. So immediately they took off and braved the 25-mile journey to Bethlehem. They defied incredible odds and battled up a hill, broke through the Philistines' camp, and got the water. When they gave it to David, he took it and poured it out on the ground. I don't know about you, but at this point I was like, seriously, David, what were you thinking? Like, that's kind of rude. <laughs> Um, but he said, far be it from me, Lord, to do this. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? But if he had drunk the water, it would have commended the men and not given glory to God. And it also would have acknowledged the risk that they took and the sacrifices that they made. It would not have acknowledged that. He said the water was basically a symbolic of their blood, and he poured it out on the ground as a thank offering. He was thankful for such amazing loyal men that were so full of faith 
and confidence in what God had promised that they would be willing to take those risks. He was thankful for the reminder that God was with them and for them and had a plan. He was thankful for the reminder that God was in charge of the seemingly impossible battles. Perhaps it was at this point that he penned Psalm 57, where he says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He's still in the cave running for his life, but his hope is restored. He remembers the covenant and his perspective is changed. In Tim, Tim Keller's sermon on this story, he describes it as an, a gospel narrative. He talks about how God did this for us. He heard our sighs. He heard our deepest longing to have relationship with him, to have that relationship be restored, to walk with him in the garden again and live in a world without sin and brokenness. And without hesitating, God himself took on all the risk and self-sacrifice, bought his way up a hill, broke through the enemy line, and retrieved living water for us. He poured out his blood as an offering. How can we question God's devotion and loyalty to us? The fact that he hears our sighs speaks volumes to the fact that he has not forgotten his promise to us as we wait discouraged in our caves or fight difficult battles or trudge through the wilderness. In fact, he has already defeated our greatest enemy and secured the throne for us. And on top of all that, he has given us himself in the form of the Holy Spirit to comfort us and carry us along the way. As we just celebrated on Easter Sunday, Jesus was raised on high after his death. He was an, the anointed prophet, priest, and king, and he is the sweet song of all believers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are loyal to us, that you have heard our sighs and our longings, and that you have rescued us with great sacrifice. Heavenly Father, help us to trust you as we wait on you. Help us to have faith and hope as we have a hard time seeing the ways that you're at work. Lord, I pray that you would help us to seek you in all that we do. Help us to look to you and ask you open-ended questions and talk to you. Lord, we need you in everything we do, and we want the glory to go to you. We pray that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.